Matthew Wembley, our poet tonight is from Western North Carolina. Uh, you have the name of town? Mm -hmm. No, it's not a town. It's not a quiz, yeah. I'm from the whole region. Wow. Well, Beach Lands is part of Southwest Virginia. Yeah, Beach Lands. Yeah, he teaches at uh, Lee's McCray. Uh, he's an only child, which was brought problem with his wife. Uh, she, he wants more no. child, which they have, and, and uh, she wants more. That's true. <laughs> yeah. uh, he, uh, the, uh, this book was the recipient of the Weatherford Award for uh, the best book on Southern Appalachian. Is that the way it's for Yes, I think for, for the year it was published. And, uh, For y'all who aren't familiar with this program, it's the Rod Altizer Visiting Poet uh, program. It's 20, although all of us, I think, at the college, at the Friends of the Library, and certainly me, forgot, but this is the 25th year of it. And uh, Rod was a English teacher up, up on the hill there and a very uh, uh, aggressive teacher. He was a good teacher, and teaching was what he wanted to do. And uh, one time we were running, and we left the highway up there, and we were going toward the middle school and all, and uh, I was just running my mouth, and I said, uh, you know, if something happened to my hands that I can no longer practice, chiropractic, then I think I would go back to teaching. And I thought, well, you know, that's a pretty decent thing to say about somebody else's profession. I've already tried teaching and couldn't do it. But <laughs> anyway, uh, he immediately started cussing me. I won't even, <laughs> I, I told uh, Matthew some of the words, but I can't listen to them all now in public. And it, that cussing went from there all the way to the front into the front of the middle school. So that's how protective he was of teaching amateur men. And just after the Friends of the Library and, and all the rest of us got the uh, uh, library here in town, Rod organized bringing four uh, nationally known poets in and they gave readings. And when he died, we decided that this would be uh, a great way to remember him. And during all these time, all these years, we've had readings by the poet at the uh, to the middle school. Both, both these readings are, are at the high school. We have a reading for twenty of the students from the middle school and then twenty from the high school. And usually, we have uh, a class at the college. And until recently, we had the reminiscent writers, and then the reading for the public. So the goal is that everybody in our community uh, is going to be exposed to a good poet, many times a after great poet. And uh, you know, we, we've had Pulitzer Prize winners, National Book, uh, 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 at least two poet laureates, and just people that don't often get to a small town. And so, Matthew now celebrates the 25th year with him, and we didn't give it due reference. Matthew. Thank you. How's everyone doing? Can you all hear me? Otherwise, this would be for not. So, it's so nice. Thank you so much, John, uh, for the hospitality today. I'm so humbled to be here, to be a part of this series and this legacy. This is a, such a beautiful space. I got to tour around briefly uh, the house, and I'm looking forward. I saw there were snacks back there. Uh, you know, come for the poetry, stay for the snacks. 
But uh, it really is a delight to be here today. It feels like home. I live in these same mountains. And I was talking to John earlier, growing up, I didn't know that poetry was happening until I got to college, uh, until I was into college. I didn't know that people were still writing poetry. I had never gotten to meet a poet. And so today it was such a gift to go and speak to the middle school students and the high school students. And it feels great to know that there's so much poetry happening here in uh, this neck of Appalachia that I, I love so much. So thank you all for having me. Um, I'm going to read some poems. And somehow I have two books uh, of poems, which is really shocking to me. Uh, <laughs> both came out during COVID. So this is the second in-person reading I've done in two years. It's the first one that I've done uh, for my new book, Daniel Boone's Window. And I'm delighted to share these poems with you today. I think I'm gonna read seven poems. That's sort of what, in my mind, I have. Uh, subject to change. Uh, but I like to say that some people haven't been to many poetry readings. And that way, even if you're not sure what's going on, you can say, okay, that, that was number three. I can do four more. So uh, I'm going to read some poems now. Thank you all again for hosting me. I'm going to start with the new book, which I think really has to do with the exploration of place and the myth of place, uh, the myth of Appalachia, a single Appalachia. I started writing a few of these poems while I was working on my first book when I was in New York City and I couldn't touch home, I couldn't feel home, uh, I couldn't see it and so I had to build sort of a psychic geography of place and my first book explores this relationship I had uh, my father and having my father who passed away uh, through place and the myth of my father and that sort of allowed me to think about the myth of place. I'll try and just read the poems. This first poem is called Summer. And I just had, there we go, Summer. This is uh, for a good friend of mine. Summer. Reborn the son of a cafeteria worker and a farmer, Vivaldi took a job down the Globe Road each summer, working the shrubbery fields with his father, counted the near endless rows of trees from the creekside and up over the mountain. He ate tabs of acid one day a month, relearned Italian, French, Spanish, grew his hair past his shoulders and picked up the fiddle to play old time after he sold a gold drum banjo for weed and rent money. He didn't believe in reincarnation or an afterlife, but practiced prayer and studied Cesar Chavez and Lenin and Jesus Christ. Out in the fields, he laughed with the migrants and plotted against the bosses, even his father, returning home each night with his lips cracked and skin burning and playing a few tunes on his back porch. No crowds appeared. In line at the grocery store, buying Coors Light and bread, no one thought him a composer of anything, and his would-be benefactors scoffed as his white arms covered in tattoos and then went back to second or third homes after a long day of tennis and card games and fashionable cocktails. Later, he delivered them green giant arbovita and rosy teacup dogwood to improve the land. Most days, he is too tired for misery. When the work is done and the bills open on the counter and the loss calculated against joy, he opens the case and there is a sound that lifts like a body beside a gravestone <clears throat> and fills the holler loud and fierce as thunder. Encomium for our last days. This is for my wife and my little girl. One day, when I don't work two or three jobs at once, Enough money for us to get by on, tucked away, sometime just before the end of the world, which waits now like the beams chosen by the crossmaker, covered in sawdust on the ground, 
a sad note, a hole in the parchment, guessed at, and not yet the backdrop of annihilations to come. Then we'll sit alone together on the couch, watching reruns, or if we're feeling up to it, drive down the mountain to drink up the last red wine of our lives at a restaurant either of us could get a reservation at before. Emptied now, the regalia of dust and cobwebs trembling just so. The leftover threads from the soft lace work on the wedding gowns of death. There, we sit in the dark together, laughing at the place settings, how the forks and knives and even the spoons that we've never used suddenly look hilarious. Surely it will fall apart. Surely our time is closing in. That's all going to be a little later. This morning, it is enough to hold our daughter by the four big windows and mimic the birds she has no names for. Black cat chickadee, Carolina wren, junco, two of them picking sunflower shells from the frosted leaf fall. A titmouse the color of all the heavens. She knows what I mean. It is enough. She cries out for my arms for all she doesn't understand. I look at the same face I've made trying to find a way to place a word into a conversation just for the sound of it on the air. Adumbration, Holothurian, Windrow. <clears throat> Example of heaven in the design of a spider web. Take, for instance, this spider. Some see an hourglass on her stomach, or a bright eye peering through a door into hell. Others see fire just beyond, a stand of spruce turning a hillside to ash. But I see a red compass arrow sweeping the dark sky as it searches north, making an X as if correcting the stars beginning to form in the night. I didn't know I could fear something as small as this, that I would wake feeling the soft as nothing touch in my hair down my chest and legs and run my hands over the cold sheets and blanket and remember I was alone. I would see dew caught in, the, caught in a web as a spider floated inside a cage of grass moving on a faint wind. She's been there all along, working on an unfinished pattern for everything. Few more than seven. The time's, the time's pretty good, you know, watching. Homily. Good evening of the Lord. The gravestones open out of the dark like stag horns through the white tail skull. In the valley of the cross, the five names of the five sacred wounds are nailed into fence posts and black cherry. Forgive those who trespass this patch of strawberries beyond the garden's edge, those who mistake a turkey feather for a hawk's. Forgive the breastfeed mother who lifts her shirt, rubs her ribs and flat stomach, praising the new muses, benzodiazepine, methamphetamine, her son in her hands, a rotted apple eaten to the seeds, bless his unwashed neck and knotted hair, his shoulder blades piercing toward heaven. Taking the long way home, I'm thinking of the faces I've seen appearing around each bend, staring out over the spears of goldenrod. So I said my father uh, died in 2012, right before I left to go to New York City. And, and uh, when I was little and my parents divorced, he moved away. and. Uh, he and I didn't really share much of a landscape growing up. And so after he died, I didn't know I was going to write elegies to him, which became a lot of the poems in my first book. But I found this way, I think, to keep talking to him through the land. And I still am. I guess it's almost 10 years now. At night. 
awake, alone, broke down on a highway 100 miles west of Laramie. Shadows bend snow fences over hills towards the end of America, past wheat grass braided like rope two feet high and fallen in one long tide as the wind sweeps clear of the trees. Suppose I can say anything to him now, infinite, unchained from life. In the liminal dash glow, he's out there, just beyond, ready to disappear. My favorite picture of him is a mugshot. There was a night when my parents were in love before I was conceived, and the slow drift between them wasn't noticeable. He'd knocked a man out, broken his nose. In the picture, he's young, wearing a rugby shirt, back against cinder blocks. He's laughing, the way a grin cuts at his cheeks, and his shadow permanent on the wall, dark enough to fall asleep in. Sort of nice for me. These are all new poems for you all, maybe. For me, it's <laughs> nice to sort of think like, oh, this is how these are going together. <laughs> but everything's new for you. Some of these are pretty old for me. Uh, the photographer, uh, Dorothea Lane, used to photograph the southern border quite a bit in the 50s. And I loved her photographs, if you've ever seen them, these black and white, uh, beautifully preserved uh, snapshots of life and people. Uh, so I was looking at these. Yeah, but I can read a poem. It's sort of towards one of her poems, or towards one of her photos. Uh, it's one that I've always found captivating because of what isn't there. This is a poem called Selenium Tonin. Crow calls, early and indifferent. A sky that won't sleep in and comes through a curtain pulled just so. The same off-white haze, the grain of it through the leaves, as once rested beyond a freight train belonging to the Pacific Fruit Express and the two rail cops looking for stowaways crossing the border at El Paso. Now they're just gloss black and white. The two cast almost no shadow, and whoever they're looking for is nowhere to be found, and you want them to have slipped out into rabbit brush and dust, hope they were only a rumor. And how for in this one moment, clandestine and cold, the slack chains under the freight cars stay silent, and here is the unseen who is the subject. Not the two men, one with his hands on his knees, the sleeves rolled back to look a little too precise, the way an artist might exaggerate the petals of a common flower in a horticultural guide. The other man is turned at the hips toward the photographer, a hammer tucked behind his belt, his back slumped, and the expression on his face like a fire one can never get going, but tries, the small whiffs of flame going out into a narrow, lukewarm smoke. This one knows he's been outsmarted, outwitted. And I think how an uneven patch of grass has overgrown the track and the multitudes of ways the state has made terror so ordinary. How these two look almost bored, two kids on the sofa while their parents entertain guests. And this was 82 years ago, how they have aged a day. That was six poems. I lied. I'm going to read. I'm going to read eight. <laughs> I think we can talk a little. That would be fun. It's so nice to be in person and be safe, feel safe. This is great. Let's keep doing more of this. Uh, I like being on the road. I'm even looking forward to the drive home later tonight. So. <laughs> I do a lot of thinking when I, when I drive. You know, it's a good thing to do, uh, mm -hmm. probably. But uh, that motion, the movement, uh, 
I think it has something to do with my poems. I was never one to shy away from hopping in the car and driving for 10 hours straight. So. <clears throat> You just wait till you get older. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, we'll see. I'll, I'll check back in. <laughs> All right, let's see. Um, I'm so indecisive tonight. Let's see how this one goes. I haven't ever read this one out loud. At the edge of dusk from Hollywood Cemetery, Richmond, Virginia. Then came the fireflies the shade sleeps under. The down magnolia leaves, brown and gold and pale. Stepping through the last applause of sunlight, it is spent flint, sparkless and cold. You hear a mockingbird practice a song above the shoreline where panhandlers have moved their tents higher up the bank into the trees of heaven and ivy. In that moment, you think of home, a childhood of solitude. The you you remember has no breath. You practiced parlor tricks that summer, cut in a deck of cards to the hearts, floated in a dollar bill between your hands on fishing line. You did this at a pool where children demanded you do it again, you obliged. For months, you showed them how to deceive. One day, a boy drags his brother to the bottom of the pool, and you jump in, lift him to the concrete, noticing how small he feels, the smoothness of his body, his hair gold and pale, the azure of his lips silent. When you breathe into him, you taste chlorine as the water spills over your tongue, gnats caught at the corner of your lips. You can see his mother crying, both hands wrapped around the boy's ankles. The sun is blinded. The slugs at the edge of the concrete are intransigent in their slimy surf. When the boy coughs, you are speechless as if he believed he would die, but he does not. Just comes back or wakes up. Whatever you want to call it makes no difference. Weeks go by and you learn to saw yourself in half, to navigate two worlds at once. In this world, you begin to work for minimum wage, plunging toilets and sweeping grocery aisles 50 hours a week. You carry ashes and spread a little here and there. The bag never feels lighter. In the woods, the wooden bridge you've run across for decades is slicked with ice, boilerplate and clear. Near winter's end, you always feel the knives of your father's fingers just behind your ears. Whenever dogs die, they go off to be alone. In this way, you are spared. The heart stops, the eyelids darken, the teeth begin to burn. You whistle and call from the front door and are met with the snow. You see where the footprints go out and don't come back. And even now, while I've been counting the hairs on the back of my hand, as the sky closes over the city, years have unraveled under the cosmos of my skull. Here the power is out. I'm 27. Branches and shattered bottles litter the sidewalks. Horseflies feast on a speckled egg tossed from a nest. In the cemetery, I follow my dog up the hill, passing the cenotaphs and headstones, the hundred-foot tulip poplar. The herons feed in the heat. A man and woman drag a moldy mattress back to their house. Smoke drifts from the red tents out of the overgrowth and tangle on the hillside. Can you also smell the honeysuckle and taste the earth drying out, the hot asphalt and brown river? See how the ants rush from their colonies to pick apart the honeybee. What will come so routinely to break us, little by little? Somewhere, your tears harden to glass. A boy is brought back to life. Elsewhere, the air is buried for good in his lungs. Overhead, the mockingbird is calling out. Chim chim chiru. <laughs> Last poem. I started writing these poems that were to something. I've got a few in this book, one in this book. I've got some new ones. 
so we'll see. This is to shadow. Along the winded mountain road, the brown meadow empties at the far edge of October. Its owner, just dead of liver failure, crossed into the grass where shadows begin to drag him apart, unlace his boots, and rub dirt into his mouth, giving out darkness until he is only a phalanx of wind passing under a wide scatter of stars. In the memories of his two horses, he existed for years as a beggar, always slumped and mumbling, a prayer into his cracked palms, the flesh almost nothing, a few coins tossed into a cup, bless each day. At last he was thin as paper, with a crease bent in the middle, which would not lie flat. And his two horses, knobby and wet from rain, or heat rising off the passing diesel salt trucks, their tails like painted water on the surface of a lake. In that painting, there's only stretched canvas and color, no trout or stones to speak of, to watch die a little or disappear into a permanent sunset. Heaven is somewhere beyond the edge of the cup bank, somewhere on the horse's callous flank where it does not exist anymore. It is an ossuary of extinct things blown apart on the last day of an open season. Months earlier, I waited with my friend, the two of us staring down the staggered line of minivans and trucks outside the county's middle school waiting for our parents. Beside me, with his back leaned up against a metal railing and his head tucked down against his chest into a knockoff bomber jacket, my friend was reading a book about foreign countries, showing me the flag of South Africa, Nepal, El Salvador, until he could not go on turning pages, until he looked convinced he would wait forever, watching over the long caravan of, of cars and become emperor of the stairwell, a wobbling handrail, cobwebs unfurling like flags from the welded joints of an awning above, and him decreeing laws under his fingertips, riding them across the concrete. Over here in the scrape of a fork through two runny eggs at breakfast at the Beach Haven Inn, I look up through an early September crowd of locals and see his father, alone and sipping from a styrofoam cup to force breakfast down. He'd come, come home one day, and like in the movies, his clothes were packed in a suitcase. His wife taught piano lessons and directed the church choir in town. And as he walked away, he couldn't hear her fingers lifting off the keys, the strings humming. That morning, as the first killing frost crept out of the ground, I rode past the little plot of land and wiped my breath from the passenger window to see the horses, blanketed, standing with the dead grass. A few birds fanned out in the northern sky. The ground heaved transformers onto their sides like animals collapsing of exhaustion. It was all plain spoken, the clearing sky, the blinking taillights of a bus, and the vinyl seats inside stinging bare skin. The veil of clouds, which looked like snow, a mother wrapping her daughter in a scarf, fastening the child's seatbelt, branches of a spruce aching, the lasting impression of wet leaves, wood smoke, careening out stone chimneys, and a window overlooking the trailer park where moths still smashed into the glass as if delighted. And in the county diner where I watched him the last time walking out the front door, I only think afterwards how his shadow stayed back and narrowed, how his body was winding down, a sundial at the end of time. Not long after, I watched his son, lanky and acne covered, bring a handful of dirt to his father's grave and toss it in. What must it have taken to stand so still to hold the dirt? This is how loss begins to work. After death, which grows inside everything you'll ever know, appearing without warning, it cares for nothing. Not names, not the proscenium beyond the forest edge, heavy with wheat grasses, larkspur, or rue anemones. Not the fledgling owls with their reflection on the surface of a frozen puddle of water. Not a boy sentenced to live on until even pain passes out of this world. In the memory of the two horses, 
there was really only one, blind from a birth defect, and her shadow darker than my own, standing guard over a kingdom of clover and down timber. The horse went crazy or grew bored enough to step over a low spot in the fence, then stood in the road one night in the middle of a curve. I can't explain what would make a horse do something like this, only how the dumb thing kept swishing its tail, looking surprised with both black eyes open, as if it could see the driver cut free of the car. The horse's rear hoofs slumped over the side, her shadow galloping in a heaven of red emergency lights. It can take years to relearn the truth, to undo it out of the past, now I'm old enough to understand. My friend's father never owned the horses, though he fed them once as I passed by. Still, the man died, and his son went on in a kind of migration without compass direction. This happens all the time. A bruised apple rots away, and parents are buried on Sunday afternoons. The small town gathering with fried chicken, casseroles, and baked beans in the family's home, and spilling out into the yard. Still, it is useful to know the parts of yourself which are shadow, the loose fabric of your country without a true border, fluttering without any wind. In the end, you will be stretched out as your shadow begins to undress you, carve you into a flat line to lay into stone. In the field, there are no horses, and when I recall one, two always appear in their lazy observances of the practice of beetles and the slow passing of each car. They are only a few words, like what is asked for of the living at a funeral beside a footprint of stone wedged into the earth. The mares, only a poor stitch of themselves, held together with rock, a little rain, a snail shell of breath. Thank you all. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think I've always been writing poems uh, since I was really little. My mom would give me a notebook and say, have at it. And I, I think I just like to play with language. And I didn't really know that it was a poem until much later. Uh, but I think, I think just, I remember being younger and trying to write a, what I thought, you know, I'm 14 or something, I'm going to write a novel. That sounds really fun. Well, you have to do the thing where you write, you know, the line all the way to the end of the page and then do that for 500 pages. <laughs> That's sort of tough. So the poem just sort of lent itself to me. I, I uh, liked the form and I started listening to poems. My mom had this, um, this vinyl of Dylan Thomas reading Yeats poems. And I used to listen to that as like a weird nine-year-old. And uh, I think maybe that I ingested some of that language. So, uh, and I don't know otherwise. Uh, Stanley Kunitz, the poet, says, the way did not choose me, I chose. Uh, I'm sorry. Stanley Kunitz says, I did not choose the way, the way chose me. So maybe that's something. Yeah. Hey. Your imagery is extremely wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, I, I think that the image is the, where I start a poem is always with the image. And I think that the image is more important than an idea, it's subversive. Uh, and so the image does so much. I think I begin and work towards an image. I don't know what image is, but uh, I did an exercise with the students today where I said, let's just do this, pick an image, anything, any object. And an image, of course, is not just the visual, right? It could be sound, taste, the senses. So let's pick one, okay? this notebook. Let's do an exercise. This notebook reminds me of blank, which reminds me of blank. Let's just see how far we can take that image, mm -hmm. right? And you could do it again. You could, tomorrow I could come back with the notebook, same thing mm -hmm. over and over. Uh, the Pope Catherine Barnett, I think she showed me that. And it's really, mm -hmm. yeah. 
the question I have for you is your poetry. Do you have a lot of rewrites, or do you just do it? <laughs> no, I revise obsess pretty obsessively. Yeah. Um, at some point, you just have to let it go, mm -hmm. right? But I think um, for this book, I had 36 notebooks mm. like this. Yeah. So I write everything by hand first, and then I type it up. Some people type first. But I had 36 of these, and then plus all the drafts on the computer. Um, and so, yeah, a lot, of, a lot of revision. I think there's a power in that idea of revision, right? Yeah. To see again. It's sort of amazing. Yeah, thank you. Did the, did the students that you had an opportunity to express your love of poetry, did they get it? Did they understand the value of poetry in their life? Or? You know, it's a big question. <laughs> um, poetry doesn't matter until it absolutely matters. When, you know, when are the occasions for poetry? Celebration, sadness, uh, when do we turn to a poem? Um, I'm not sure, I'm not sure if in the, that moment they said, yes, this is it, this is the meaning of life, as I might not have, as I wouldn't have. But I do think that knowing that it exists, poetry is something we turn to naturally as, as humans. Um, I remember talking to a friend who was in Manhattan uh, on September 11, 2001, and she said, you know, the weeks right after, um, walking around lower Manhattan, people were just putting up poems. They were just writing poems, because they didn't know what else to do. But they knew that. They knew they had that. And so hopefully some of the students there today who were really, you know, brilliant, especially the ones who spoke up, they were they thought, wow, this is this thing that I've done that no one else has ever done before. This construction of language, right? So at least how I look at it. And I think I think they have that now. And so what's next? What do they what will they have when they need it? They know they've got something. So that's sort of an answer. <laughs> Other than yourself, who's your favorite poet? <laughs> I can answer that actually pretty easily because I'm obsessed with this poet Larry Levis, who uh, is a contemporary, but he died in the 1990s. Um, but he's probably the poet who I read the most, um, selfishly. So, but I could name, you know, it would be unfair to name other people. He's dead, so <laughs> <laughs> I can name him. Uh, but I can't make any comments, can he? <laughs> no, no, no. But uh, I do think. I was putting together the acknowledgments of my books, and there's a lot of poets who are friends of mine. Uh, and I think about the writing of a poem is really not, it doesn't belong just to me, it belongs to everyone else, uh, to you all. Uh, it doesn't belong to me anymore. And those poems, writing them, aren't just mine, they're the people in the acknowledgments. So and there's a number of poets there, um, uh, particularly poets like uh, Joe Millar, Dorian Locks, uh, Yusuf Komenyaka, Marie Howe, Sharon Olds, um, and then my friends, Scott Brownlee, uh, Javier Zamora, Monica Sook, Emily Yoon, uh, Nicole Seeley. I could see now I'm getting into trouble because of <laughs> <laughs> someone. Yeah. So, so, yeah. But a lot. I mean, there's so much poetry around. We're living in such a great age of poetry. so. Um, there's a voice for everyone. Yeah. Hey, I have a question. I think you were saying that poetry didn't have a, real, a realization of poetry until you got to college. Is that mm -hmm. right? Yes, yeah. Do you think that was just a happening? Yeah, so uh, I love uh, I love a series like this, so uh, thank you so much uh, to the college here to Southwest Virginia community college for having poetry and, and especially in an area that like Appalachia is often it's harder to get to for one it's not a, on the main you know I guess 81 runs nearby but uh, I, I didn't know not for a lack of great teachers that I had in high school and middle school who were saying write poems 
but I thought Sylvia Plath was sort of the last poet. And then I got to college, and I took a creative writing workshop. And it changed my life in no small way. I thought I was going to be a lawyer, which, thank goodness for you know, anyone who needs re legal representation. It's not me, but, uh, but that was revelatory to understand that that was a way. Not that I had to do it in the academy, not that I had to now teach poetry, but that I could still write poems, and it was a serious thing. Well, I really, yes? One other question. How did you feel when your first poem was published? Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, really excited. Mm -hmm. And I remember, I remember where I was. And I also just thought, this is it. This is it. Watch out, world. <laughs> right? And then you got to do the thing where you write more poems and you get rejected over and over and over. And that's part. So it felt really good for about five minutes. And then after that, my life didn't change. And so, and it was changing, but not because of the poem, like the publication. Right. I was like, I'll just write more poems now. Well, you became an artist then. It, and that, you know, it at least gave me the sense of, okay, this isn't completely absurd that I'm right. doing this, right? <laughs> so that was, that was really nice. And then, and then it was scary because then it meant, okay, well, if it's not absurd, do I actually pursue it? Mm -hmm. that, was, that was sort of scary. Thank it you. still is, yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Of course, then you moved from doing a poem to doing a whole book, so yeah. I wanted to ask, how do you look at your books? Do you look at them as a, a continuous work or merely a co collection or a collection where you see threads of themes or a little yeah. of all? Yeah, I think, I think the, the books themselves have a narrative. Uh, to all the poems in them. But I think that the poems speak to each other across books. Mm -hmm. I'm writing new poems now. Um, hopefully I'll have a third book one day. Uh, Yusuf Komunyaka said, uh, still says, uh, asks, I guess, you know, maybe we just are all writing one poem. So I think about that a lot. Well, this has been a real gift and a pleasure, and uh, I hope I get to talk to you some before I have to hit the road. But thank you all for coming out and spending your evening with me. I saw there were karate lessons down the road. <laughs> for or something, so I'm glad that we're here uh, talking poetry. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you.